Revelation 17, Babylon, the prostitute on the beast. One of the seven angels who had the seven bulls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits by many waters. With her, the kings of the earth committed adultery, and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. Then the angel carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and se ten horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold, precious stones, and pearls. She held a golden cup in her hand filled with abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. The name written on her forehead was a mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and of the abominations of the earth. I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of God's holy people, the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. When I saw her, I was greatly astonished. Then the angel said to me, why are you astonished? I will explain to you the mystery of the woman and of the beast she rides, which has a seven heads and ten horns. The beast which you saw once was, now is not, and yet will come up out of the abyss and go to the destruction. The inhabitants of the earth, whose names have not been written in the book of life from the creation of the world, will be astonished when they see the beast, because it once was, now is not, and yet will come. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. There are also seven kings. Five have fallen, one is, the other has not yet come, but when he does come, he must remain for only a little while. The beast who once was and now is not is an eighth king. He belongs to the seven and is going to his destruction. The ten horns you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but who for one hour will receive authority as kings along with the beast. They have one purpose and will give their power and authority to the beast. They will wage war against the Lamb, but the Lamb will triumph over them because he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And with him will be his called, chosen, and faithful followers. Then the angel said to me, The waters you saw where the prostitute sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. The beast and the ten horns you saw will hate the prostitute. They will bring her to ruin and leave her naked. They will eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to accomplish his purpose, by agreeing to hand over to the beast their royal authority until God's words are fulfilled. The woman you saw is the great city that rules over the kings of the earth. This is the word of the Lord. So uh, I think I told you guys, when I was a kid, um, you know, my mom was Buddhist, my dad was Baptist, like marginally, but we had to go to church. There was no ifs, ands, or buts, and it was an old school Southern Baptist church super boring and um i had to dress up in a suit so i'm hot miserable and the only solace was revelation i would turn to the book and i'm like prostitutes and dragons yes <laughs> this is this is it and so um as we've seen many times i feel like um the baptistic movement when you try to find commentaries on revelation uh they kind of dominate it and, and and since the left behind series if you're christian and familiar with that um, was kind of present uh, in, the, in the 90s, that interpretation of Revelation has been dominant, just the, the, the futuristic interpretation. I'm not saying it's a bad interpretation. I just don't think it's the best interpretation. And I think this chapter is generally, usually, one where futurists are, are really trying to hard to figure out, all right, who, who are the ten horns? Who are these ten kings? Um, and, and, I, and what I want to try to do, and what I've been trying to do the entire book of Revelation, is show you why I think an idealist perspective, that's a symbolic interpretation of the book versus a literal interpretation of the book. And again, it's the only book I'll suggest doing this with. I won't say go through the book of Ephesus and what does it really mean? Is this really? No. What most books of the Bible say is what they mean, unless it's apocalyptic, which is Revelation, that's a style of literature, that's symbolic, um, and parts of Ezekiel and Daniel. If you try to woodenly exposit and interpret an apocalyptic text, it will get weird, and you'll find yourself trying to retrofit your life and your circumstances into what the Bible's saying versus the other way around. So I think when you pause, drop back, look at the big picture, you get much more out of the text, which is what we've been trying to do these 17 chapters, and what we'll try to do to the very end. Okay? So... So real quick, I think, why is it important? We'd like to start off with that. Um, it's super important because this chapter highlights the power and deception that everyone is currently immersed in. 
Christian and non-Christian alike. When you read about this prostitute and you read about this beast, it's sitting in these waters. I, I call it, it's like this unholy tea bag that's just sitting in the water. And we're the, the, the water is, the, when you, you read later, we're the water, right? We're the multitudes and tribes and nations. Like the diversity of earth, human beings, are in this water that the unholy tea bag, the dragon and the, and the woman, are sitting in, and it's permeating everything. And so that's why last week's exhortation was to stay awake. And that's why over and over again in the scriptures you'll see the exhortation to stay awake. is because this unholy tea bag, described as something that makes you drunk and just lulls you to sleep, uh, it permeates you and and it has power over you. And it's very, very deceptive. All right, we'll see that in a second. The next slide. I want to go over some symbolic numbers in the Bible because I think this sets the tone for the chapter. Because when you're looking at this king that was and wasn't and seven kings and then one dropped out, and then you're like, oh, man, is this, are, are, we, are we talking Roman emperors here? Are, are, are these presidents? Is this Obama? Is this Trump? Is this Biden? Uh, is this the European Union? It gets chaotic and crazy. And so let's draw back and just look at sevens and tens in the Bible because we're dealing with symbolism. And so symbolically, the number seven is a foundation in God's world. It, if you count every time it's used, including seventh fold and seventh, it's 860, there's 860 references to the number seven in the Bible. And so we've seen, we, we said over and over again, it refers to completeness and perfection in the Bible. So anytime you see a seven pop up, that's generally what's being um, like explained or, or, or that, that the author's trying to stress, okay? We've seen seven a lot in scripture. Now the number 10 is similar. It's used 242 times. And it also conveys completeness and order. Okay, no, next slide, I'll show you examples of this. So here are all the sevens. If you look at, um, go, I'm going to go back to that, go one forward. If you look at all the sevens in, in Scripture, one more forward, forward, the other way. There we go. That's, it, that's the other four, yeah. <laughs> here we go. So you see there's seven days in the creation narrative we've looked at seven churches we looked at seven angels who oversee the churches we looked at seven spirits which represent the spirit of god the holy spirit seven seals seven trumpets and seven bowls which which represent complete and perfect judgment against rebellion and injustice on earth we've looked at the seven heads of a dragon seven angels who declare and execute seven angels with the seven bowls and here we see seven horns on this beast and so It's not so much emphasizing, hey, figure out who the seven are. It's saying, hey, recognize that when seven is used, completeness is being conveyed. So if it's a perfect picture of the Holy Spirit, that's what the seven's used for. If it's a perfect picture of God's judgment, that's what the seven's used for. If it's a perfect picture of God's enemy and our enemy, then that's what those horns are representing. Does that make sense? So focus on the seven and what that represents, not who that could be in history or modern day. I think you, I think you lose the point of the text when you hyper-focus on trying to fill in, the, fill in the gap. If God really wanted you to know who they were, he, he would have just told John, hey, this is Nero. Hey, this is Antiochus Epiphanes. Hey, this is some dude named Trump in the future. Because God could do that because God can do anything. So now when it comes to tens, you've got ten horns of the beast, We've seen that in chapter 13 and in 17 today. Ten toes in the statue. Now, if you go back to Daniel, remember, 70% of Revelation is rooted in the Old Testament. Now, in the book of Daniel, which is also apocalyptic, he gets this vision of this statue. Uh, The head, it's got a head. It's got, I think it's a head of bronze. No, it's a head of gold, a chest of um, silver, a belly of I can't remember the, the precious metals, but, but anyway, the, the, the horns, uh, the, the toes of the statue are a mix of iron and clay. But the point is, it, it's not, we got to figure out who the ten toes are. The point is, there's a giant mountain that comes out of heaven and it smashes into the statue and, and destroys it completely. Like, that's the point of Daniel 10. It's a connection, the connecting point is, we're looking at a complete enemy of God here that's, trans- that, that's been around since the beginning of time. Ever since there's been a devil, he's worked through culture and society to produce a formidable foe for God and the people of God. Well, really the people of God because there's no foe against God. 
Now, as we continue, ten horns of the fourth beast in Daniel, it's the same idea. It's not figure out who these ten, hor ten horns are. It's more, hey, it's pointing to a perfect enemy of the church and the people of God. Ten commandments. These are the perfect laws of God, the complete laws of God. That's why there's ten. And then in the book of Job, if you read Job 19, he, he talks about these ten reproaches of his, of his friends. There's only, there's only been five when he says that. But he's saying, you guys have been perfectly dissing me, like over and over again, like perfectly putting me down. So does that make sense? So we're looking at perfection and completion by sevens and tens. So I just want, I want to set that as a backdrop as we read the text so you don't try to figure, oh, who are these people? Who are, because I don't think that's the point. The point is these are perfect and complete enemies of the church. And if we didn't have Jesus on our side, we're going to lose every single time. If we weren't filled with the Spirit as Christians, you're going to be deceived like everyone else in the world. All right, now, let's go to the, I just wanted to kind of clear that. Now go back one. One more. Now, three enemies of the people of God. One more thing I want to kind of set the tone with is, you see this beast pop up in two occasions. If you go through Revelation 13 and 19, remember there's lots of threes here also. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the great harlot, the beast, the false prophet. We see a lot of threes in the text also. The beast has always represented aggressive violence against the church. Anytime we see this beast represented, again, it's less about who is this beast, and it's more about what it does, and it is aggressively violent towards the church. I mean, like, chop your head off violent. Not, oh, people are mean to me at work because I'm a Christian. Not talking about that. I'm talking about aggressive persecution, uh, what Coptic Christians in Egypt go through, uh, what, um, you know, any persecuted church goes through. They're experiencing a manifestation of the enemy through the beast. The false prophet is deceptive heresy. That's always been present also. Whenever you see the false prophet mentioned, um, it's just— it could be cultic. It could just be really bad theology that sets you on a wrong path. It could be super sinister and, and, and polar opposite of the truth, or it could be just really subtly different. And over time, the distortion becomes clearer and clearer. But that's, a, that's always been an enemy of the church. This is our enemy right now. And then finally, the great harlot, which we're kind of looking at today, and this beguiling affluence. Remember, if Revelation is a book that over and over again is trying to show you the reality of warfare and the fact that we're at war, and I said several sermons again, like if you live in the Ukraine, like you know you're at war. You're on high alert. You're not planning your next vacation or anything like that. You're like, no, it's on right now. We're, we're at high alert, like battle station ready. And I think what, what John is trying to do, who wrote Revelation, and what the Holy Spirit is trying to convey is, that, hey, the reality of the last days that we're in right now is it's war. And what the great harlot, the unholy teabag, is so good at doing is it is it getting you to forget? It's just, no, it's not. It's vacation. This, this is vacation. It's not, it's not war. We, we don't think about that. Just just live your life and, and kind of be functional atheists. Just, you know, you got hell insurance because you're Christians. It's all good. And earth, just enjoy it. And again, I'm not trying to come across fire and brimstone and, and say don't have fun or plan vacations. It's not what I'm saying at all. I'm just saying that from what I understand when I have conversations with people, our great temptation as the Western church is to live in comfort and to live like we're at vacation, not at war. And that goes right in line with the text with what the great harlot is so good at doing. All right, now, that's my preface. So next slide. Uh, there's like 10 points. This isn't my number three, three point, but I'm going to go through them fast. All right. So the first thing is uh, we want to look at Babylon. When, when, um, when Lana read, uh, we've already, Babylon reoccurs over and over in scripture. And remember, uh, Babylon is like diametrically opposed to, if you have Zion, which is a picture of God's kingdom in heaven, then Babylon is the, the opposite of Zion. If you got the kingdom of the people of God, then, then Babylon is the, the, the kingdom of the people of earth. Um, it's uh, Revelation, and 17, Revelation 16 and 14 have already declared Babylon's destruction. Remember, Revelation is a book of hope if you're on the right side. You're like, ah, oh, injustice is finally dealt with. All those things that have slid through, the, slid through the cracks over the years. All the injustice on planet earth, as I've said many times, 
from human trafficking and the people who get away with it, to, to, to rape and, and, and pillage and plunder and, and genocide, all of that is dealt with once and for all through those seven bowl, vial, and trumpet judgments. It's God's perfect, perfect vanquishing of injustice once and for all. So Babylon's fall is it's declared in 17 and 18. It's, it's, sh- it's detailed. Clearly, you see the fall. Babylon is mentioned 287 times in Scripture, more than any other city except Jerusalem in the Bible. So, so the Holy Spirit, if he, as we believe, guided the Scriptures, he's wanting you to get a clear understanding of the enemy, of the people of God. Genesis 1, uh, sorry, Genesis 11, 1 through 10, shows that it was after the flood, Babylon was the seat of civilization that was diametrically opposed to God. The Tower of Babel connected, that's kind of the, the foundation of Babylon. They did the opposite of what God said to do. He said, hey, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. What did they do? They congregated and tried to build their own way to heaven. So we don't need God. We'll do our own thing. And so rebellion from the first book of the Bible is associated with Babylon. So Babylon has always been present. In John's day, it was largely, largely manifested by the kingdom of Rome. But it's always been the world. When, when Jesus talks about the world, you'll see the last point, do not love the world or the things of the world. It's talking about Babylon. So it's the system, the underlying, sometimes overt, often deceptive system that's set up against the people of God. And maybe you can notice it. I think sometimes you can notice it in conversation. I find you could say, just through my years on earth and the conversations I've had in different places, I can listen to people talk about the weirdest things they believe. But if I mention Jesus or the cross, it can easily come across highly offensive for whatever reason. I've always found it interesting that whenever you look at like just a genre of like death metal, like if you're into like heavy metal, it's always anti-Christian. It's never anti-Buddhist or anti-Islamic. like It's just that they're taking shots at Christianity for whatever reason. I don't know why. It just There's interesting things that I notice over time that I'm like, well, that's funny. It's funny that there's this low-key anti-Christian vibe that's present, it's all part of this idea of Babylon. So verse 1 declares that you're, it's John saying, hey, you're going to see a close-up view of who Babylon is and how it's going to go down and how it's going to be destroyed. All right, so straight away, just that's who Babylon is. Next point. Now you see the great prostitute. Verse 1 and 2, the whole idea of a prostitute is it's she's enticing. So Babylon is, is, it's alluring, okay? So she is uh, drawing you in. She's permeating. She's sitting in waters. I've said that several times. I just want to convey that. It's all around you. It's the water you're swimming in. You can't escape it. Christians traditionally have either, I mean, the temptation often is to just build walls and sequester yourself from humanity. Like, you can't. You just can't do it. It's everywhere. I don't care if you homeschool or live in a prairie or whatever. It's in your heart and it's around you. You can't you can't escape it. One, it's interesting, her target. You see this reference to kings over and over again, but not just kings, earth dwellers. So it targets everyone, but there is a hierarchical exploitation, it seems like. Like kings are sought after. And I think you could say in our modern day, movie stars, famous people, because there's a lot of power they bring with them (laughs) and a lot of followers they have behind them. So if you can deceive the top level, it's much easier to deceive the earth dwellers. Does that make sense? And so there's a strategy to Babylon's methodology. She's the antithesis of the bride of Christ. So Babylon is our opposite. If you read who's the bride of Christ, it's the church in Revelation 21, 9 through 11. The same things are said. In our text, the angels, hey, uh, John, you're taken up to the spirit. I'm going to show you this person. I'm going to show you the great harlot. In Revelation 21, it says John was taken up in the spirit the same way, but I'm going to show you the bride. So if the bride dressed in white is a picture of the church, which is kind of awesome. And just so you know, I got got two weddings I've got to do in June. And my whole spiel when I do a wedding, just heads up, 20-minute wedding. I'm really good. I'm fast. (laughs) Um, But I'm always conveying that. The purpose of a marriage on earth is it illustrates the relationship that God wants to have with people. So according to uh, uh, Ephesians 5, 
the husband represents Christ and the wife represents the bride, the church. And so a marriage is supposed to be one of the greatest witnessing tools on the planet. It's often not, but that's the whole idea of scripture. Um, here you see Babylon is the antithesis of the bride. So it's our diametrically opposed enemy. Make sense? Uh, she's arrayed in scarlet and purple versus white, like the bride, so she's not pure. Beautiful and alluring. Purple was a royal color back then, so alluring, but not pure. Uh, she's lovely. It's interesting. It says that John was astonished in the text. The word is thumazo, which we get the word amazed from. And it's just so interesting. He's like, he's, he sees the prostitute where Lana read. He's like, I was astonished. That means he's like enamored, drawn in, like, whoa, she's so beautiful. There used to be this Pokemon. Uh, y- y'all ever watch Pokemon back in the day? <laughs> just me, huh? Um, I had a, it was not just me. I had little, Kristen's little brother and little sister watch Pokemon. I may or may not have gotten into some of them. But there was a guy named Brock, and he would always, he was like just, he loved the ladies, and he'd always be like, she's so beautiful. He was always smitten by anybody, and his eyes would get all starry or squirrely, you know. Then. But that's kind of what happens to, to John. He sees the harlot. And he's astonished. And it's so funny. The angel kind of rebukes him. He's like, why are you astonished? Like, why are you, why are you drawn to this? And, and then, the, as we'll see in the text, the angel, like, shows why he shouldn't be astonished. Because even though she's beautiful and enticing, she's actually filled with the blood of the church. So she's destructive, evil incarnate, actually. But I just want to stress that. Like, Babylon is beautiful. It's, 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 it's alluring. Remember, Satan, according to the scriptures, was the most beautiful thing God ever made. The most beautiful angel, an anointed cherub. So beautiful that he was filled with pride and led to this rebellion in heaven that led to his expulsion. The Bible describes the devil as an angel of light. So we're not talking about, I mean, if you've ever fished, the whole idea is understand what the fish are biting and fish with that kind of bait. That's the whole idea here. Like, this, if this is the enemy of the church, it's going to look good to try to deceive people. If we're trying to draw people in to point them to Christ, Babylon's trying to draw people in to point them away from Christ. Does that make sense? And so um, she's lovely to look at. He was, a, he was amazed. And on her forehead, again, remember, we're seeing a lot of mimicry in the church. Earlier in the text in Revelation 7, our, we're marked, the people of God have a, we're marked with, on our forehead with a seal of God. She's marked on her forehead with her own seal in these blasphemous words. So we see mimicry here again. So she is the enemy of the church. She's filled with the blood. She drinks the blood of the church. So I just want to convey that. We're talking like alluring psychopath, <laughs> right? Beautiful murderer. You're nice on the eyes, evil incarnate. So it's like a, it's a double whammy. All right, next slide. And then we see the beast again. We saw the beast in Revelation 13 when he was making war against the saints. The point of the text is not to figure out how, who the beast is. Who is this antichrist? Is it a person? Was, the church has always had these ideas of who this antichrist is. In John's other book, in 1 John, he equates Antichrist to a spirit, and I think that is more in alignment with what Revelation is trying to convey. Can it be a leader? Absolutely. Could have been many leaders? Absolutely. But the idea is anytime you see any political leader or any sort of affront to the church that's violent, the beast is at work. So if the prostitute's job is to lure you in and deceive you, the beast's job is just to remove your head from your body. It's another enemy. Scarlet in color, covered, scarlet in color and covered with blasphemous names, having seven heads and ten horns. Now John is about to get, the angel's about to get more descriptive as to who these horns are and who these heads are. He's really, he's not super clear on who they are, but he goes into it, but I just want to convey, use the background you have now on what sevens mean and what tens mean and who the beast is, and I think that helps fill in the gaps of what the text is trying to say. All right, next slide. The angel explains. So verse seven, first thing, do not marvel. John, do not be sucked into this. 
She's nice on the eyes, but is evil incarnate. Recognize who the harlot is. So that's the first thing he, he, he says to do. Verse 8, the origin, resilience, and destination of the beast. It's not saying, what does this mean? Who was? And who, like, if you try to interpret that woodenly, what, what ends up happening is, okay, so there's an antichrist. He's prob- it's, it's a dude who comes to power. He gets assassinated. He's dead. He rises from the dead because it says he wasn't, he was, and then he wasn't, and now he is. So that means this future leader is going to get assassinated, is going to resurrect, and people are going to freak out like, oh my gosh, no one's ever been resurrected except Jesus. This is the Antichrist. I mean, perhaps, but I don't think that's what the text was trying to say. I think that makes you a little kooky where I was part of a movement every, every single New Year's Eve, we had a prophecy update. And out of the 15 I went through, none of them came true. And so there's always an explanation the next year. Like, well, hey, this is what really. And I'm like, why are we doing this? Like, after a while, that's kind of why I pivoted. And I still love that movement. No, not hate. I still preach at their things. But I'm like, you know, I'm not digging this consistent, like, false, di- like, false expectation. And causing people to live in fear. I'm like, this, I, don't think this is the, I don't think this is the healthiest theology. So I went to seminary and kind of relearned, got some new mojo, and um, I think have a healthy understanding of certain things, particularly when it comes to eschatology, which is the fancy word for how, how things go down in the end. All right, so um, that whole was and is and will be, I think, is a reference just to the permeant, it, it, it's the permanence of the beast. And then there's a call for separation. If you look in the text, The people are called to come out. Look at verse 8 and 17. It says, um, And the dwellers in the earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will marvel at the beast because it was and is not and is to come. So the power and the permanence and the presence of the beast will cause you to marvel if your name is not in the book, if you're not elected, if you're not chosen, if you're not a believer. And so that's why the angel kind of low-key rebukes John saying, why are you marveling? You're not supposed to marvel at this if you're part of the people of God. See through it and recognize that the prostitute and the beast are enemies. Does that make sense? Next verse is 9 through 11. He explains what these seven hills are. Now, some, you know, Rome was described as a city on seven hills. Some think that's a specific reference to Rome, quite possible, because that was the Babylon of John's day. But it's definitely a description of the temporality of all power, because the whole point of the verse is not who are the seven hills and who are the seven kings. It's the fact that they all go to destruction. So I want to say that one more time. It's not the, the point of that, those verses is not to send you on a wild goose chase to figure out who they are. It's just to convey that they are ruling for a short time. Their power is limited and they end up destroyed. Does that make sense? So it's not about who they are. It's about what happens to them. And that is you lose when you fight against the Lamb of God. You lose every single time. Now, verse 12, the ten horns. He also says there are ten kings. And he says they have power for only one hour. Again, that's the emphasis. It's not who are the ten kings. Are they the ten toes? What about the ten horns? It's just saying this is a perfect, complete picture of a perfect and complete enemy. Specifically, a a bespoke, handcrafted enemy. I mean, you can't get any better than that threefold enemy of the church. We'll either get you by cutting off your head. We'll get you by false hair, by, by, by confusing you with doctrine. Or we'll get you by luring you into worldliness. One, one way or the other, you're going to fall on one of those three traps. And so the exhortation, the encouragement that John's trying to write, the church is, hey, don't fall for it. They're destroyed in the end. They're a challenging enemy for sure, but it's short-lived. That's why it says one hour. Does that make sense? Now, if you interpret that literally, okay, cool. There's 10 kings somehow in the earth. And people used to say this is the European Union, but then the European Union got bigger. There's like 27 nations now, so there's not 27. <laughs> so you can't use the whole toe thing. For a while, there's like, oh, European Union. 
and then down the line it's going to be like a, a demonic European Union. And, the, and, and I'm just like, no, you're missing the point. It's just saying that the enemy is perfect and complete, and it's always been around in Daniel's day, in John's day, in our day, but it only lasts for an hour. Oh, so what does that mean literally? Oh, you're going to come to power, but which is one hour, and then after that one hour, no, it's just saying, hey, it's short-lived. It's temporal. Be encouraged, church. Not only do we win, the enemy's real, but we win, and their ability to hurt the church is for a small amount of time in the, in the grand scheme of things. So the point is not who the kings are. It's that they fight the lamb, verse 14, and they lose every time. That's why if you go back to Daniel 2 and Daniel 7, he points out in the context of both passages the destruction of the enemy. I just want to stress it again. Okay, it's not about who they are. It's about the fact they lose. Anytime you see this reference to 10, the destruction of the 10 and the short time they have to rule is always referenced because that's the main point of the text. Not who they are, what happens to them. All right, next slide. So what's at stake? This is kind of my main point here. Revelation 7.15, the waters on earth equal the peoples, multitudes, and nations and languages. So that's who the devil is gunning for with his brilliant threefold plan. His, his threefold plan to destroy the church with the great harlot, the false prophet, and the beast. Who's it, who are they targeting? Right here, the peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. That's why she's in the water. That's why both of them are in the water. Okay? Now, a picture of heaven, one of my favorite in scripture, Revelation 7, nine. those magazines we have out, usually Revelation 7, 9, it's all about the diversity, and the EPC, the denomination, our, 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 our heart for diversity that's always been around. Um, but this is what it stems from, the singing in heaven. So you get the waters on earth and the singing in heaven. Look at this dichotomy. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language. Same as here. Standing before the throne and before the Lamb, they were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they crowd out, cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And so what's at stake, church, are these people, right? We know the truth, which I know most of you in here. We, we're aware. C can we get lured in? For sure. Can we get deceived? For sure. That's the whole reason we have church and, and other Christians in our lives, because we remind each other of things we forget, because this unholy teabag is everywhere, and it, it permeates our thinking, and it's easy just to fall asleep. And, and the whole purpose of church is some, sometimes just to remind you, the whole purpose of community group, the whole reason I want a Slack channel where we can exhort each other, encourage each other, and remind each other of why we're here, that the enemy's real, and that souls are at stake, Right? Like, this group of people are the people that are in your lives right now, that God's put in your life, that's put at your workplace, that's put at your school, that's put in your family. They're the ones that are blinded, and the text says, drunk and deceived by this masterful plan of the enemy. And so, next slide. So I want to end with an application after this point. You just, the enemy is destroyed at the end of the text. God's always, it's just a, if you read the text, it just points, God's always got a plan. He's always in control. There is no the devil versus God. It's, you, you can't. Any battle that we've seen so far in Revelation, they're not, it wouldn't make for a good movie because it's just not, you know, it's just not even a war. It's not even fair. Like when you see the last picture of the enemies of God, against Jesus, like, it's literally Jesus comes out of the sky and a sword comes out of his mouth, and in one verse, everyone's destroyed. It's like you can't fight against God, and so God's got a plan. The enemies of God are depicted as literally destroying themselves in this text, so the, the, th that unholy trinity literally implodes on itself in the next, ver next section, and then a final warning is given to, to us. She will be destroyed. That's the end. But for now, she's a great city that has dominion over the kings of the earth. It's a warning. Like, hey, church, she's destroyed. But right now, she's present and active and has power. So be aware. And so this leads to my final point, the application. This is what Jesus called us to do. 
He says, if you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you were not of the world, I chose you out of the world. Because I, but I chose you out of the world because this world hates you. Again, not hates you because you're annoying. Hates you because of your association to the cross. Because you're God's people. So Babylon automatically hates you. There's a target on your chest because of who you're associated with and whose you are. This is what I want to bring out. John 17, 14 through 16. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them. This is a prayer of Jesus to, to God the Father. Because they are not of the world. Even as I am not of the world, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. And this is the whole idea where we get the whole in the world, but not of the world, which you might have heard before. So are you supposed to escape? And join a monastery and just peace out. No. You're supposed, this is, this is the precarious situation we find ourselves in. You're supposed to go into the teabag waters, <laughs> all right, swim around and find out what part of this multitude God's called you to reach. That's why our whole mission statement is helping all people see the beauty of Christ more clearly so they can live on mission more fully. That's your mission. Who has God put in your life out of that multitude that's drunk and blind and deceived? Who has God put in your life to pray for, to speak to, to love well, and to be present with in hopes that they might be awake like you are and called out of this? That's the point of this chapter. Not finding out who the seven kings are, or the ten horns. No. The point is, it's a perfect enemy, but we serve a perfect God who destroys this enemy, but keeps us on earth so that we can join him in the renewal of all things. That's the point of the text. So God help us to do that. Let's pray. God.